Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 5th, 2017. This is the week in charts. As usual, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I am humbled by your presence. So what do we talk about? Well, I guess the big question is, the $64,000 question is, uh, do we have a new bull leg underway? And so far, I guess the question, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we're also going to talk about your questions on trading, obviously, and your favorite stock picks. If you don't mind, wait till we get to the charts, the live charts, I should say, before asking about individual stocks. Feel free to ask about as many as you want. Just hit return. Otherwise, it's a little hard for me to figure out which ones I covered and which ones I didn't. And I want to continue to follow up on trend trading. I want to talk a little bit more about discretion using a live example. And then I also want to talk about staying in the game and more importantly, where the money is. And that'll make a lot of sense in a minute. One thing I was thinking about this morning, I guess one thing I think about every day is, uh, is it's hard. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about why trend following is hard, but you can do it. I think we make it a lot harder than it needs to be. And I'll give you a few things in a few minutes here that I think will help. I guess before we do all that, we have to look at the disclaimer screen. I can sum it up pretty quickly. All predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. So I want to recap a little bit from last time we met, which I think was way back in the uh, middle of December. And uh, I'm going to kind of breeze through these. So if you find any of this interesting, then uh, go in and watch the last recording uh, of this, uh, of last, of uh, when was it? Oh, 20, whenever. The last time I did a show, go to YouTube and get that. I think it's also live on my website right now if you want to save the link. But what I was talking about is that trends are tough to predict, but you can follow them forever. So we're trend followers. We're not trend predictors. We wait until there's a trend or at least a very serious emerging trend in place before we get on. Now, they're tough to hold on to. And... As I said last time we met, Covell equates it to a bouncing Bronco, and I have a lot more to say about that. And it's sort of a trend's job, if that makes any sense, or a market's job, I should say, to shake you out. And as I often say, a market's job is to fool the most amount of people. And these are adages that I, that I borrowed from Linda Rasky, and she told me she wasn't sure where she got them. But anyway, I give her credit. And the other thing that she once said as a corollary is that a market will often do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. Now, even if you do catch a trend, you're going to be wrong in the end. And you have to get over it. Now, I've done quite a few talks and written some articles about being in a state of regret. And that's actually been statistically proven that when you're in a trade, most of the time, in fact, up to 75% of the time, even a profitable trade, you're in a state of regret, meaning that trade is moving against you. So that's kind of an interesting observation. And again, they're all going to end badly. So you just have to get over with it. You're either going to give up some profits sometime along the way, or you're going to flat out lose. So you must be willing to let go of your ego. And sometimes that's hard to do, especially if you're smart. If you're smart, it's going to take longer. And if you're here, you're smart. And I'm not kissing up to you. It's just the fact that people who take time to watch a webinar, to learn things, and read books, and, and, and look to educate themselves and become better at what they're doing, or usually educated to begin with. And the smarter you get, the harder it's going to be. And you have to be willing to let go your ego. As you guys know, I'm my nickname is Trend Falling Moron. It, initially, when somebody called me that, I was I was very hurt, deeply hurt, because the person who called me that, who I'm pretty sure who it was, they were anonymous, but the email stopped as soon as I called them on it, uh, is someone I had a lot of respect for. And in a few weeks or a few months prior to that, they would they were basically singing my praises and thought I was a uh, thought I walked on water because some of the things I was doing just by being a trend follower. And then when he started fighting a trend, he got pissed off. But you do have to let go of your ego, and you're not going to look smart. You're going to be wrong a lot. And it takes you a while to wrap your head around all these things. And the smarter you are, the harder it is because you want to 
you want to get out of the market at the first signs of adversity. Well, I can guarantee you nearly all trades at some point will go against you. You want to get out of the markets when you're up by a big percentage because, let's say 100%, just pull a number out there, because, well, quite frankly, you don't get 100% that often on a trade. But as soon as you take profits at 100%, you'll never get you'll never make anything more. And the real money is in the longer term trends, which we'll talk about in just one second. Now, more on trend trading. Uh, trends go much further and last much longer than most are willing to believe. 1999 was a prime example. I mean, even in present day times, I mean, how how high can this market go? Given the fact that we're due for higher interest rates, uh, you could throw it, throw whatever type of analysis you want to throw in. Throw in fundamentals if you must. I know I just said the F word. But logically, we probably shouldn't be where we are. But what is, is. So you can't confuse the issue with facts. And don't think too much. Just follow along. And it's hard. I know. The, harder you, the smarter you are, the harder it is, as I often say. Now, the real reasons and rationale will come long after the fact. And again, as I preached, I just preached it a minute ago, unless you're Bubba, what is, is. Now, just a real qu quick recap. Blech, recap. <laughs> Hope that wasn't a Freudian slip of things to come. Uh, you want to recognize current conditions. And quite frankly, they're up, down, and sideways. It's so funny. I was uh, telling my wife I'm, when I roll out this, in, uh, this new course I'm working on, this intro course, uh, I'm implementing all this new uh, GWIS software where it's going to be really interactive and really cool and I'll have quizzes and all. And she's like, oh, what are you going to put in the quiz? And she's making like a little uptrend. She's doing this with her. You can't see me, but she's making these little, uh, I guess I'll get a haircut. So next week I can turn on the camera and show you. But she's making these little up sounds and down sounds and sideways signs, you know, like up, down, sideways. She goes, what do you do? You could do that? And I'm, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> but... I know I kid a lot about this, but you, I would be, I would be, you would be amazed. Let me just slow down. Too much coffee today, Dave. Um, I'm off the Mountain Dew, but I'm still on Diet Coke, so I'm not, I'm not completely uh, clean over here. Uh, but you'd be amazed at how many people email me, and I swear, even the, even smart people, people who had a lot of education, a lot of serious education, and the stock is doing this, and they want to buy it. OK. Um, stock is doing this and they want to buy it. Stock is doing this and they want to short it. OK. That's not what trend following is all about. Trend following is also staying with old positions until you prove it wrong. And guess what? You will overstay your welcome. And I think I have a great example this week where we might have just overstayed our welcome. But hopefully I'll be talking about it a year from now. And guess what? At some point, we will have overstayed our welcome. All trades, eventually, and badly. Now, continuing to recap, trend following is changing sides on new positions when a transition appears to be in the works. And you will be a little late to the game. Now, we might, hopefully, we're a little early talking about this. Let me explain to you what I'm trying to convey here. Uh, I remember in the late 90s, or I should say early 2000, the market began to turn. And a trader who I was very friendly with was shorting. We had been long the week before like crazy, buying with both fists. And I found it amazing that he was able to make the turn so quickly because the signs were there, things were rolling over, shorts were setting up. And I was a little slower to make the turn, although I eventually did. And I don't think I've wrote about this quite a bit. If not, I've, I've certainly talked about it. Yeah, I wrote about it quite a bit. So you can't fight the last war, even though it sure does feel good when you're when you're long and things are just going straight up. And all of a sudden, to be the turn, well, you have to recognize that a turn may be in the works. Now, I, I, I emphasize new positions when a transition appears to be in the works. And that means that you start seeing shorts set up. You don't rush out and bail out on all your longs. And if you've been following along with the service for a long time, and uh, 2016, early 2016 was an example, 
you know, we'll be long, let's say we're long three or four stocks, three stocks, okay? And then the market looks like this. Well, what will happen is we might put a short on, okay? Now, if the market goes right back up, we get scratched out of this short. We lose a little bit. We, we you know, we live to, I think I just said short. We get <laughs> Yeah, we might short, but, uh, you know, we live to fight another day. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. The other thing that could happen is the market does turn into a bona fide rollover, and then a few things might happen in the portfolio. So we're long three. We get short one, okay? Maybe we get stopped out of one or two of these. Maybe this one just defies gravity and keeps on going. And then next thing you know, we're at two or three or four shorts, okay? So if you go in and look at the archives, and I know I have a big gap missing because the files are like 10 gigabytes, and I keep I keep – saying I'm going to get them up. I'm not hiding anything. I just got to get them up. I got to figure out a way to to get them all uploaded because I have some huge video files out there. But anyway, um, and, and I know you guys are waiting on me for that. So I got to get that up there. But um, email me for the link. The link is somewhere on my website. If you're on the uh, delayed service, you can at least see the last couple of years. I have those all posted live. But I do have a gap in there. I, I promise to fix that someday. I just need to clone myself. But the point is that you will, at some point, begin, have to change sides and recognize that the tides may be turning. And you can't continue to fight that last war. Now, the other thing you need to do is learn how to sit on your hands when the market begins to chop sideways. And you might get whipsawed out of the existing positions and put on some new positions before you realize before you're, uh, i got to fix that slide, before you realize that the trend is turned sideways. So what I'm saying there is, let's say the market's doing this and then starts to chop sideways. You might still be trading because this might just look like a little consolidation. And then you might start getting stopped out of positions and maybe actually even put on a new position. So your portfolio equity curve might look like this, but it will flatten out. Because as a trend follower, you don't know that it's it's sideways right here. I mean, you know, shorter term, it's sideways. It's kind of like the Russell 2000 right now, which we'll take a look at in a minute. But you don't know if it's going to keep going sideways. But eventually, you start getting stopped out, you'll see less and less setups. And if the market just continues sideways, then you end up flat. So that mitigates your drawdown. If the market begins to roll over, you will, yes, lose money initially, but then you'll start making money again as the shorts begin to kick in. I have a YouTube out there where I've looked at the uh, discretionary portfolio. Uh, and one thing I pointed out is what happens in the bear markets. And the bear market, the bear market equity curve looks a lot like this. It begins to roll over with the overall market. Why? Because all the longs are stopping out. It begins to flatten out because maybe we don't have any setups. And then it begins to climb again because we're trend followers. We don't care if it's an uptrend or a downtrend. I'd much rather an uptrend, but if you can't be in the trend you love, love the trend you're in, right? Is that a Crosby, Stills, and Nash saying about that, I believe? All right. So even more on trend trading. I was thinking about this lately and even recently. Every time, it, just because I just because I decided to be a trader doesn't mean a don't still have a pulse, okay? Every time I hit a little bit of a drawdown, even if it's a short term or even just a shitty day, you know? It bums me out a little bit. I mean, I'm still alive, okay? So one thing I've been thinking about lately is it's harder than it looks. It looks pretty darn easy when you're looking at the charts. It's like, oh, look, just buy here and sell here. That's, that's pretty darn easy. And maybe I make it look easier than it is, but it's certainly not as hard as people make it it's just harder than it looks. So I want you to be aware of that. I don't want you to think that I'm oversimplifying how hard it is. Although I do think, again, people make it a far more complex than it really is. The smart people send me emails all the time, again, with a chart that's been headed south for months and they want to buy it. It's like, no, no, stop trying to outsmart the market. A big thing to do is be cognizant of your own feelings. And that goes for in trading and in life in general, okay? And there's a lot of things you can do. And I'm not going to go into too many details today because I've covered it quite a bit and I will be covering it in a lot more detail when, we, when I get around doing uh, something, some more uh, work on psychology. 
but just little things like we do have this little uh, limbic system thing working up in our heads and it helps us to make these flight or fight decisions which are very important for surviving in life but as far as trading in certain other situations not so much these snap decisions that we make are very good if you're getting ready to get hit by a, a bus jump out the way don't think about it you can't say well geez I, I wonder if this bus driver really likes me I, you know why is he gonna hit me you can't do all that you gotta just get out of the way right but there's little things you could do once you recognize that physiology. For instance, it takes about, I think it's a second or two to get past that amygdala, that flight or fight, little tiny so-called lizard brain, and get to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. So next time you're in a fight with your spouse, not, not in a fight with your spouse, but next time you're thinking about having a little quip back at your spouse when she says something that aggravates you or he says something that aggravates you. Count the three in your head and then think whether or not you want to say it or not. Now, I, I told my wife about that and she kind of looked at me like uh, like I pooed in my pants, kind of like I went to Starbucks and ordered a, you ever go to Star, Starbucks and order a cup of coffee? coffee ugh, cup of coffee, they look at you like you pooed your pants, you know? Um, you have to say a grande latte, you know, up, whatever. So, yeah, I'm guilty as charged. Sometimes I say stupid things without thinking. But I will tell you this, since I've done a little study of the uh, amygdala and the limbic system and read a few books about these things, I've learned, not all the time, but sometimes to actually count to three. And I've caught myself on several occasions. I can think of a few of them in my head right now. I'm not going to say what they are and what I would what I was getting ready to say because I don't want uh, her to watch this recording and one of you guys to rat me out. But I'll tell you, I have stopped myself a lot, okay? But not all the time, but a lot. So learning to embrace some of these things is important. Just be cognizant of your own feelings in life and in trailing. So let in trading. So let's let's talk a little bit about being cognizant of your feelings and embracing them. Now, the reason I'm saying embracing them without going into too much detail, because again, I've written extensively about this and, and done videos on it, but use the, you want to use the word embrace and not eliminate. You don't want to eliminate your feelings. You don't want to eliminate your emotions because if you did that, you would no longer be alive. You have to embrace your emotions because you cannot function as a human being without emotions. Every decision you make has emotions attached to it. People who have had injury or illness, and this is based on the research of Shaw and Damasio, but they can no longer function as a human being. At least that's where I got the research from. I'm sure somebody else has done some research too. They can't make any decisions. So if you ask them, hey, uh, would you like to meet tomorrow or the day after, they'll reason why they should meet on one day, then reason why they should meet on the next day, and then they will start over again and, and they arrive at a stalemate because there's a, no emotional consequence associated with either day. So in life, start thinking about every decision you make and think about what that consequence is. I My diet could, could be a lot better, okay? I'm, and I probably say this almost every day, but like, I'm really thinking about some fried catfish for lunch, okay? And there's going to be a, there's going to be a consequence involved with that decision. I'm going to be lethargic this afternoon, and then now I'm going to be fatter, and then there's other health concerns, right? So there's there's always an emotional consequence involved. So that's why I use the word embrace. Now, when you're trading, you want to be cognizant of those emotions. And if you get stopped on a position, you're going to be pissed off, okay? And it's tough, I know. But you need to ask yourself, did you follow your plan and still lose money? And that's the hard part. So if you did, then you need to get over it, or better yet, you need to pat yourself on the back for doing the right thing. And that's the tough, somewhat perverse 
thing about this business is sometimes you can do everything right, 100% right, and still lose money. And I don't know who to attribute it to. I did read it in the Kirk Report, so I'd give him credit. But he said he had somebody quoted, and he said, outcomes are noisy. So I'm not sure who said that. If you guys uh, know who did, didn't, please let me know, or if you read the Kirk Report. Um, but outcomes are noisy. And if you just look at that a small sampling, it doesn't necessarily mean anything. Sometimes you could do the right thing and still lose money. Now, if you did do the right thing, here's where the tough part comes in. Is the stock or other market truly set up again? And sometimes it's hard to go back to the well, so to speak, especially when you just fell in that well, you know? <laughs> Uh, it's human nature to avoid pain. There, there's that freshman psychology, read its ugly head again. So it's really hard to go back to the trade, but you have to be willing, again, to let go of your ego. Now, there's two things you have to realize here. There's, you have to recognize the difference between being prudent and revenge trading. A litmus test here is if you were just imagine yourself and, and you're if you're picking up on this you have to play a lot of little games at least I have to play a lot of little games in order to function as a trader so you have to play the I'm just seeing this setup game and that means that you're just looking at it's just you have to look at the setup like you're seeing it for the first time and if you say you know what this does look like a good set setup. I'm going to take it. But you can't, double negative here, you can't not take it <laughs> because you're pissed off at the instrument. Believe it or not, the stock doesn't care about you at all. Okay, you have to get over that. So make sure you're not revenge trading, like trying to get your money back out of that particular trade. If it's not set up, then move on, okay? Don't try to prove you're smart by capturing, by trying to capture a, the next move and take another trade and then lose it again. Now, there's a fine line between being obstinate and being prudent, okay? The definition of the insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different outcome. So that's always in the back of my head, too. Now, I do a little, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of intraday trading, but I do a little Forex trading on the side. This is not the bread and butter of stocks. And the longer term trend following is the real bread and butter, which we'll talk about here in just one second. But I will do some Forex trades. And if I, uh, I kind of dabble in this stuff. And if I reach a point where I think it's worthwhile uh, sharing on a, on a bigger level, I'll, I'll probably do more of that. But, um, you know, it's nothing proprietary or anything. I'm basically using some of the same or the exact same trend following techniques, except I'm looking at hourly charts and trading bow ties off for major highs and lows, and it seems to work fairly well. Anyway, um, but recently I went after a trade like two or three times. It got stopped out two or three times in a row. But each time I look at it, it's like, you know what? This is a setup I would take in and of itself. So you almost have to forget about what instrument it is, forget about what stock it is, and ask yourself, is it worth taking? And then right now, I'm not, I'm just, the screen's in the background here. I have to find it. But I think I just paid for all three or four of those trades. It doesn't always work that way. Now, you might, I mean, that's the perverse thing about markets, too. Sometimes you might just end up with two or three trades, and they just flat out don't work. So you have to recognize the, the intuition, intuition, I-N-T-O-W-I-S-H-I-N-G, versus your intuition, which is, um, I borrowed that line from Market Wizards. You have to make sure you're not doing some sort of revenge trading. And that can go two ways. That could say, I'm not taking that trade because it's just loss on it, and it could be the greatest setup in setup town. Or revenge trading would be like, it's not set up, but I'm going to go ahead and prove how smart I am by taking a new trade. So either way is a bad idea. So you must recognize whether or not you should get back in, go back to the well, so to speak. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the fact that sometimes – you might be getting stopped out a lot. So if you are getting stopped out a lot, then you have to ask yourself the question, is the stock off to take it off without you? So do you get stopped out 
and then watch in anguish as the stock takes off without you. Now, that's going to happen. I mean, usually when I talk to an audience, I say, okay, any whatever got stopped out to the penny and then watch it take off in anguish without you. And then nearly everybody raises their hand. If you're trading for more than a few days, that probably, or at least eventually, will happen to you. But what I'm talking about here is if you're getting stopped out, stock takes off, stopped out, stock takes off. And this happens over and over and over again. And as I've said quite often, it was two different people. And I, I get the numbers a little mixed up. But I think it was 19 or 21 or somewhere. It was it was a lot. Somebody said, hey, I've been stopped, stopped out 19 times in a row. And someone else said they've got stopped out 21 times in a row. Well, there's either two problems there. One is your stops are too tight. So you need to study volatility. If the stock is bouncing around three and four and five points a day, and by the way, if you're getting stopped out a lot, shoot me an email. I'll give you a hand. We'll figure it out, okay? It's either one or two things. Your stops are too tight or your stock picking can use a little work. So if your stops are too tight, first of all, try loosening up a little bit. And again, if that stock is bouncing around three and four or five points a day, you can't use a one or two point stop. You're almost guaranteed a loss. Now, if you think your stops are in line and you're still getting stopped out a lot, then maybe your stock picking can use a little work. Now, warning, a little soft sell here, just ahead. Your best defense is a good offense. I talk a lot about using stops and money management, but remember, garbage in, garbage out. So I would say get the stock selection course. And the way I look at it is one new improved stock pick. Or if you avoid just one bad stock pick. Now avoiding bad trades is hard to quantify. But trust me, if you're taking bad trades, your account's going to let you know. And it's going to be hard to get out of that drawdown. Now on all the courses I do, you have unlimited lifetime support and access to all course upgrades and related live events. Um, as I said earlier, I'm in the process of rolling out some new uh, software that's going to be really good on the educational front. It's going to force you to take lessons. It's going to force you to take lessons in order. And by the way, that's a big problem that I'm seeing is 90% of my emails are like, go back in and watch this. Did you watch that? It's like they tell me they did, but I don't think they did. A lot of times people are just skipping around and they're missing little gems that are in between. So uh, as I upgrade these courses to uh, the new software and everything, uh, one thing good about my methodology is there's not a huge amount of new things that come out. The IPO stuff and some of the IPO patterns are probably the newest thing that, that's come out in a while, and that hasn't changed in a couple of years. So there's not a whole lot of things that change, but... As I said earlier, uh, when I freshen them up, I, I'll put anything in there that has. And it's more of a tweak. If you go back to 2000 and look at like my first book, you'll see that it's pretty much still the same stuff with just some minor tweaks in between. And I have a, a, um, a new intro to the book that, that outlines all that in the PDF. So anyway, you have unlimited lifetime support. Now, that's not saying, hey, Dave, I'm working on a trading system. That's a different type of support. But if you want to ask me a question about a stock based on something you learned in the course, then by all means. And then you have access to all course upgrades and related live events. Um, occasionally with courses, as you know, I'll do some live events around the course and follow up uh, afterwards. So you'll have access to all of those forever. And then one thing I'd encourage you to do at the least is just watch the free intro video on my website. So if you just go to the website shop now and click on stock selection course, which I think is the first, second one down, you can get that free video. So at the least, just go in and watch a video because I'd say uh, quite a bit, over half of the problems that I see can be solved in that video. And then uh, no uh, promo code or anything. And you'll save 500 bucks on that. And I might even feel, I'm feeling kind of generous. I might even throw in a few months of the trading service. So not only do you see it in theory, you see it in practice. You'll see me do exactly what I said in the course. Anyway, let's continue on this trend following thing. So it, uh, great questions coming in. Just give me one second. Let me um, 
let me stay on a roll here, and I'll get to those questions, I promise. All right, let's go back to CNX, which is in the open portfolio, and we'll take a look at the actual portfolio here in just one second. So we had a buy way back in February, and we had a stop. Now, point-wise and percentage-wise, it seems like a pretty big stock stop, but when you look at the chart, it's really not that big, right? Uh, like I said earlier, your stop must be adjusted to the volatility of the stock. And then we had an initial profit target right around 12 and change. I think it was 12.30 if memory serves. And then we trailed the stop higher. Now, this has been a dead money report over and over over the last well, nearly a year. We've been talking about this one. And you could see that it went sideways for almost two months. But Dave, you're a trend fighter. The trend's going sideways. Yeah, but so what? Okay. You're in longer term trend following mode. Sometimes markets consolidate. So it did go sideways, went sideways again for about a month. And then it began to look dubious by selling off fairly hard. Well, what do you do? Nothing. Let the market make the decision for you. By the way, trading is what? Making decisions and what? Living with them. So the less decisions you make, the easier your life is. So just decide to leave the stop where it is. If you get stopped out, you get stopped out. And then once again, it looked pretty dude. Went on to make new highs. What did I do? I gave a lecture. See, I told you to just stick it out, tough it out. And it went on to make new highs. So what did I do then? Gave another lecture. Just tough it out. And then what did it do? It went on to make new highs. And then now, eh. Selling off pretty bad. So now it's even more dubious. So what do you do? Just stay the course, okay? We might get stopped out today, tomorrow, the next day, or maybe next year. And then again, in the end, we will give up some open profits. And that's not fun, but it comes to the territory. That's what trend following is all about. And again, it's like riding a bouncing Bronco. It's good. Every time I put this slide, uh, this slide in, this comes from uh, Covell's book because he equated, again, riding the trend to, uh, I want to make sure I give him full credit, um, riding a trend to, it's like riding a bouncing Bronco. The, when I was a freshman in college, my, my parents came in town and we all went to the rodeo and my brother and sister, I think, were along for the ride and uh, no pun intended. But uh, anyway, uh, we had seats fairly low, but towards the back of the arena. And first, first event was the Bronco riding. And the first thing that happened was this, this horse comes charging straight at us. And it's flopping all over the place, bouncing around like a bouncing Bronco, right? And this guy got thrown like 30 feet off this horse or whatever. It, you know, it just seemed like 30 feet. And my mom screams, oh, my God, he got thrown off the horse. The horse threw him. And we put our heads down, but we were laughing. It was still funny. I guess she didn't realize that they actually got thrown off the Broncos. So uh, if you've, if you've never been to rodeo, you have to go at some point. It's, it's, geez, that's probably 20 something, 30 years since I've been to one. I want to go to the uh, Angola rodeo, um, the prison rodeo. I hear that's uh, quite the experience. My wife's scared to go, but I, I'm going to make it a goal this year to go to rodeo. Maybe you guys can join me. We could um, check that out. Now, keep in mind that you're riding the bouncing Bronco, and in the end, he's going to win, okay? In the end, it's going to end badly. You're either going to lose, make a little lose, or lose a lot in the end. But the deal is, once you get on, and once you're holding on for dear life, and I'll, you know, I'm making it sound a lot more scary than it is, all you have to do is just honor your stop. What do you do? Well, put the stop in and forget about it. Go have lunch, okay? So even if you get stopped out, once you're in this longer-term trend-following mode, once you've been in the trade for a month and you're taking partial profits out, or in this case, eight, nine, ten months, hopefully eight, nine, ten years, right? So what? You give up some in the end, but net-net, you have to look at the net-net gains. Now, you're not running a – this is an advantage of being a private trader. You could do the right thing. It's – it's like sometimes I'll, I'll get up and talk to people that are running money and stuff, and they're like, well, what would I tell my clients if I gave up all that? Or He's like, well, you know, or I can't trade that more volatile stock because my what would I tell my clients? It's like, well, tell your clients you're not doing a good job 
because you're not trading properly because you're trading to appease them. So, yeah, you're going to have a drawdown in these open positions. But you kind of have to look get past that. I think it was Dennis, and in fact, I know it was Dennis, in the Turtle Book by Richard Faith. I mention it quite often. I need to get my book uh, page up again on the website. Amazon kicked me out because I didn't sell enough books to them. Uh, other people's books, I should say, not my own. But I need to get that uh, page up and going again. But uh, what's Curtis' Facebook? The Way of the Turtle, I think. I'm looking through my bookshelf now. I don't see it. It's somewhere in there. But, yeah, it's a worthy read. And he, it basically, in that book, he said that Dennis treated open drawdowns differently than he did. Drawdowns to open profits, I should say, differently than open losses uh, drawdowns. Okay? So what Curtis Faith was saying that is that Dennis recognized that it came with the territory. And I think that if you learn to embrace, embrace all these things that, that, that come with the territory when it comes to trading, then your life becomes a lot easier, okay? You don't feel like it's, it's, it's never easy, okay? But it doesn't hurt you as bad knowing that, hey, that's normal to give up these open profits in the end. I want to talk briefly about a discretionary example here. We talked about this one last time we met, and this was a, a fairly new issue, an IPO setup here. We had a nice little pullback, and there it is down there in the portfolio. And we had an initial profit target up here at 33, I think. Let me confirm that. No, well, where is it? Where is it? 33, yeah, I'm sorry about that. And it came really close to it the last time we did a show. And then the next day, it actually gapped higher, and it came within a few cents again of that initial profit target. And then once again yesterday, it neared it again. Now, if you go back and watch the last show, I talked about not splitting hairs. So... When you're in a trade, remember the first loaf is a swing trade. And the second loaf or the second half of the trade is a longer term trade. Now, when you get into a trade, you don't make two separate transactions. So if you're buying 200 shares, you don't buy 100 shares and buy another 100 shares in some other account or whatever. You just buy 200 shares. And if you get the swing trade out, you flip it out. And at that point, your stop is at break even. And then, and I hate to use the word hold, but hopefully you hold on to that bouncing Bronco for a long, long time. So the real money is in the second half of the trade. The swing trade just keeps you in the game, okay? Because a lot of times you just get the swing trade out, then you get scratched out and arrest. Now, longer term, that's a losing strategy to just trade for a swing trade at a scratch, okay? Longer term, you will have a big adverse move. You're just simply not going to make enough. And that's a problem a lot of times with a lot of these, these, these so-called income-producing strategies. Well, income-producing strategies take very small profits, and they take profits often. Unfortunately, you never get a big profit in. And sooner or later, you're going to have that Tlaib type of black swan move against you, and it's going to be hard to make that up. If you're making a lot of money in your longer-term trend trades, yeah, it's going to suck when some bad event comes along, but you're going to be able to, to walk away and fight another day, okay? So the real money's in that second loaf, and that's why we're here, okay? These are the ones we've been waiting for. The second loaf here is where the real money is, and that's that longer-term trend trade we just talked about in CNX. But again, we take these short-term profits just in case that longer-term trend doesn't materialize. Remember, we can't predict a trend, but we could follow forever. We could find something that looks poised to resume its trend, but it's still going to be a probability at best. So again, the real money's in the second loaf. So don't split hair so much when it comes to taking profits in the first loaf. That's okay. Okay? Even if you end up with a little bit less than 1%, that's not why we're here anyway, okay? Remember, we're, we're risky 2%, $2,000 out of 100000 portfolio. So we're looking to make one k on the first loaf. 100 k 100 k would be nice. one k on the first loaf, or $1,000. And then some multiple thereof. And you can see this play out over and over in the service. 
not as much as I'd like. I'd like everything to work. Obviously, we do have a loser every now and then. But you can see it play off out quite often. You'll say, hey, there's a thousand, there's a thousand, there's a thousand round numbers. So it's okay if you get a little bit less. Even where this thing closed, I mean, obviously you want a little bit more than that, but that's still a pretty good first trade, 0.82% on the first loaf. That's not bad. Um, but when it's, when it's in within a penny, you know, if you're getting 0.95% versus your full 1%, that's probably close enough. Now, I've done quite a few lectures on this, but just real briefly, if it happens over a short period of time where the market goes straight up right after you get in, it's kind of like don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Even if it's this close, it's okay to take it. Now, don't take profits here. you got to take enough profit to make it worthwhile to help pay for that, uh, keep the lights on, whatever, <laughs> you know, quote feeds and all this other good stuff we have to pay for. But if it gets close to, really, really close, sometimes within a penny, or I, I see people not take profits. Like, come on, guys, you have to just, you, ha you don't know when that's going to end, so you have to be willing to take the partial profit. Anyway, I know Chief Arm is really wound up today. All right, Phil says, it does not look hard. Just draw a big blue arrow. Yes. And it's funny, when, when the market's trending, as it has been recently, I actually every now and then catch myself thinking, boy, this really is easy. This trend following thing is really easy. Now, whenever I whenever I find myself thinking like that, what happens? I get my ass handed to me. So it's like the market constantly humbles you. So if you got a big ego, the market's the wrong place to be. And I know people with big egos in this business, and they're not making any money trading. They, uh, well, I don't want to get into it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I got a few questions coming in. Okay. Craig says, it's human nature to try winners again. Ask anyone that hunts or fishes if they have favorite spot. That's the psychology of just one positive reinforcement. Same for avoiding negatives. Um, yeah, it, you know, you could, you could have um, sometimes, it, this doesn't happen often, but every now and then, especially if you go and look at the service archives, um, sometimes we'll have, we'll be, let's say we're, we're in a stock and have like a trend knockout. Let's say we get in here and we're trailing a stop higher, take a partial profits, a whole nine yards, and then it'll come down and have another trend knockout. Well, and this will stop us out of the trade, okay? Sometimes we'll actually come back in the next day and say, okay, guys, let's, uh, let's go ahead and get back in if it rallies up again. This doesn't happen often. I can think of a few cases where it has, but it's not something that happens every day. Now, my concern is that this thing comes up, triggers, and then dies, and they lose money. And it's like, well, I know I might aggravate some people, but I know in my heart I did the right thing, okay? And the litmus test there is at least I could sleep at night, right, knowing I did the right thing. But you have to be careful. You can't fall in love with the stock and say this is the greatest stock in the world. I'm going to hang on forever no matter what happens, and I'm going to get back in if I do get even get knocked out. So, yeah, you have to be careful uh, with that. You can't get emotionally attached. And, you know, I said a minute ago, like this trade fall I think is easy. Even when things are good, it's still tough because you're still going to have a really crappy day. And that's why the service, every day when I say, Okay, guys, we got waxed a little bit today, but let's not get too excited as long as we're following along. Or, or on the flip side, yesterday was a really good day. It's like, you know, I don't jump up and down and say, hey, guys, we're great, we're smart, we had a fantastic day. I'll say, eh, well, you know, we did okay today. That's good. That's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not upset about that, but I want to kind of keep those, those feelings on an even keel because I know tomorrow some of that could evaporate. So even when things are good, trend following is still tough. Patience is key, and that's the patience to wait for a position, and that's the patience to wait in a position. I need to, yeah, that sounds pretty good. That's the patience to wait for and to wait in, okay? 
And once again, stay cognizant of your own feelings. And, you know, trade like someone is watching. And that's that's sort of the epiphany for me. And I have to occasionally remind myself of that. Because no matter how much you know about markets, you're still always going to have a little doubt in you, when, especially when something's going against you. And um, on a positive example, I, I had a bunch of positions on once, and this was when uh, this is outside of stocks. But anyway, my wife walks in my office, and she's like, "What's going on?" It's like, "Well, you know, I've got all these positions. They're doing they're doing really great, but I'm not sure what would do, what to do." And she's like, "Well, what would Dave Landry do?" And she walks out and shuts the door in my office. I'm like, "Ah, oh, shit, you know." Well, kind of aggravated for a second. It's like, well, what would Dave Landry do? So I started selling, and then I started adjusting stops. I did what I'm supposed to do. And, and again, being cognizant of what you're doing is a constant uh, reaffirmation of what needs to be done. So when I was in uh, a position recently, and it was really going against me, and it's like, okay, well, even though I'm not going to write about this particular one, and knew I probably wouldn't, but I said, well, let's just pretend, and again, here you're seeing this game theme arise again. But I was like, let's pretend that I was walking someone through this trade, or I was going to write about the whole thing afterwards, and 80% or 90% of the time, the stock, it was going against me, okay? I'm like, okay, this makes a great example of stay the course. So you need a trade like someone is watching. And if you could find a, a partner that has similar interests, then by all means do it. And as I wrote in my last column, uh, for you guys who are brave enough to get your wives involved, uh, do it. For your wives who are brave enough to get your husbands involved, don't. But for you guys out there, if you're brave enough to get your hu get your wives involved or husbands, depending on your uh, sexual preference, I, prefer, <laughs> I, I assume. But uh, let's just assume you're married to a woman. Uh, if your wife gets involved, if, if you're willing to let your wife look over your shoulder, uh, the study was done by uh, Montier mis mentioned it. I'm not sure who actually did the study. But they found that the trading improved for the guys that got the women involved. And I think that's because the women were more likely to do the right thing, uh, not to trade for ego purposes. Okay? So I think... Ego is a worse sin of trading than emotions because we all have emotions. They say, was it Drucker Miller or um, one of those guys? It wasn't Drucker Miller. It was another famous hedge fund guy that said women are too emotional. I disagree. I think ego is worse. And I think this study proves it. So the women who got involved with their husbands, the husband's trading actually got a lot better. And I had a client that said, said, you know, you're doing the right thing, but then you go off track and you do all this crazy stuff. And then you come back and you do the right thing. And then you go off track and do this crazy stuff. And I, I hope he never fixes himself because then I'll have nobody to talk about, right? But all kidding aside, and I do love him. He's he's my favorite client, well, one of my favorite clients. In fact, I, lo I, lo I love all my clients. But anyway, long story endless, I said, you know, we see this reoccurring pattern, and he knows it too. I said, would you be willing to get your wife involved? And he's like, oh, no, that would end the marriage. So it's kind of like... Um, Denial, you know, so I think recognizing the problem is the first step. And anyway, where I'm getting to with this whole thing is the flip side was that the, the wives who got the husbands involved, the wives trading actually have gotten worse. And from what I'm seeing, what I've seen, and I don't know if I have a representative sample, but from my few female clients, they all seem to be very successful. I did have one woman contact me uh, three or four years ago that that did some really bad things and, and, and just kind of failed miserably in, in, a, in a major way. And I feel bad about that because uh, not because there was anything she did that I said to do because she was fighting trends and not honoring stops and all these other things and overtrading and all these things I preach about not doing. But it's it's kind of like a, that's more of a um, aberration than, than anything else. But most of the women are a lot more disciplined in what they're doing. So I know some of you guys don't want to hear that. But anyway, trade like someone is watching. Like you would have to explain – every trade you make. And I think some people just don't want to be held accountable for their trades. And in the case of, of some of these guys I know out there, they're trading at a relatively small size based on their net worth. So the wife never sees their trades. Okay. 
So trade like someone's watching. Say, okay, I'm going to stay in this trade. So like someone's next to you. Say, okay, I'm going to trade in this, stay in this trade because even though no one's there. Now, you might look a little funny, and as I often say, I hope the voices in my head aren't bothering you, you know? <laughs> somebody who does it. Somebody, for somebody's first uh, webinar is going to be like, what the is going on with this guy? <laughs> A couple of announcements real quick. Hey, Happy New Year, in case I forget. Uh, again, we have a sale on stock selection course. And then uh, I, each week I threaten, but we're getting closer and closer to this, uh, to getting this uh, stock selection course out there. I'm sorry, the uh, introduction course out there. And I'm really proud of it because I really think it's something that you have to come back to. And even some of these guys that really know what they're doing but aren't, doing it properly or falling in the same pitfalls and all. As usual, in everything I do, there's a big psychological backing. I think you have to come back to the beginning. And, and what excites me about this new course software is that you're going to have to go through the course. And then I might even set it up to know whether you went through the course or not. So if you ask me a question, I'll say, uh, go back and rewatch, especially because you didn't watch it in the first place the first video on this and, and some of your eyes may sometimes your eyes may glaze over and some of the stuff because it's so simple but every now and then I think there's a very succinct little gem in there which will help help you do the right thing and what's interesting is I never know what's going to click with someone and every now and then I'll say something that makes so much sense like uh, one that comes to mind just kind of while we're having some random thoughts here is that uh, Douglas once said when you make a trade and you lose on that trade, it's not the loss of that one trade in and of itself. It's the loss of every trade you've ever made in your life when it comes to your emotional feelings about that trade. Okay? And it's kind of like if you have a, a teenager or a millennial, I guess they're kind of one and the same, but uh, at home, you'll know that if they do something to upset you, or even your spouse, I should say, it might not be that one little act in and of itself, but it might be the hundred other times that they did that same one thing. And that's what brings up those emotions in you. So, again, learn how to embrace all that. Now, do make sure you're on the delayed service. Um, I did have to thin out the delayed service a while back. So once you're on about a year, I'll probably have to cut you off. If you want to stay on and you can't afford the live service, then just shoot me an email and say, hey, Dave, would you mind just keeping me on? And I'll be happy to do that. But um, as I often joke, good traders make good decisions. If it takes you over a year, you probably shouldn't be trading. <laughs> and if you've got any questions or anything, shoot me an email, Dave at DaveLandry.com. All right, a couple of questions coming in. Let me get through those quickly, and then we'll hop to the uh, individual, individual charts. If you guys want to start asking about individual stocks, do so now. Uh, I'm going to go through market action, sector action, then we'll hop into the individual uh, stocks. Thank you, Susan. Okay, Rick. Dave, I've traded some 60-minute chart bow ties without waiting for the pullbacks, just the bow ties. Do you think this is too risky? It worked a couple of times. Um, well, one thing I like uh, with – I don't like to do it in stocks because it's a little too too noisy. But in Forex, what I was kind of alluding to earlier is I do like to – I'm not fighting the trend, don't get me wrong. But what I do like to do is I like to look at markets that are making major highs or major lows, ideally multi-year highs and multi-year lows. Now, keep in mind, I'm not fighting the trend, but if on a daily chart it looks something like this, and then ideally, if it's losing a little momentum, I mean, there's some other things. I don't want to get into too many details here. There's a few other things to look for. But for argument's sake, let's just say that on a daily chart, you're up here towards multi-year highs. Well, what you could do on an hourly chart is you could start looking for a bow tie, okay? I think I might have misread your question. Let me, answer, let me finish this thought, and then we'll get back to the question. Um, so... Once you have that bow tie set up, remember, this daily is going to turn on the hourly first, okay? 
Now, we're just in this for a trade. Hopefully, we capture a, a bigger, longer-term move that we're in for weeks, months, or maybe even longer. But on an hourly chart, we're looking for some sort of turn off a major high. So the first thing I would do if you're trading an hourly bow tie is to make sure you're trading them off of major highs or lows. Because let's say a market is kind of in a mid-range like this, okay, and just trading back and forth. And let me just kind of make this longer term so it doesn't really look like it's at a high or whatever. But if it's just it's kind of meandering back and forth and you get in and try to trade a bow tie or something on an hourly chart, well, you might pick up a trade or two, but for the most part, it's chopping around. So if a big move does develop, you're in. If a major correction comes in, at least you're in. And through proper money management, you get a nice little trade fired off. Japanese yen, dollar yen right now is a good example of uh, what's unfolding there right now. Now, his question was, he's not waiting for the pullback and he's had some success. Well, ideally, you want to wait for that corrective move to happen. And what happens a lot of times in markets, and I've seen this quite a bit too, is that... And this could be a daily, a five-minute, 10-minute, 100-minute, 1,000-minute chart, whatever you want. But let's say a market begins to correct, like a generic pullback. I'm sorry. Yeah, that'll work. Uh, market begins to correct. Well, a lot of times what happens is it keeps on correcting, okay? So by waiting for that correction and then waiting for an entry, a lot of times you can avoid a bona fide reversal. Now, he's saying he's not waiting for the pullback. Well, let's say you do recognize that trade and just jump in midstream. Well, unless you're trading a very inefficient market like an IPO, I do have a pattern that actually buys at those new highs with uh, quite a few caveats. But unless you're trading a super-duper inefficient market, and even, even then they're still prone to correct. So you're much better off waiting for that correction to occur and then look to get in on a resumption of the trend because that'll help you in a lot of cases to avoid a losing trade. So even though you've had some limited success with it, I would encourage you to wait for that setup. And yeah, I know sometimes it might roll over and go a while before pulling back. But you have to be willing to let go of your ego and wait for that setup to happen. Okay? Two time, three time, next, I find another stop. Two time, three time, next, I find another stock. What do you mean, uh, Howard? Howard says two times, three times, next, I find another stock. If you make two times your initial risk, no. You want to make ten times. You want to make a hundred times your initial risk. You want to make as much money as you can. You want to be a greedy bastard, all right? And, you know, that I don't want to get into this whole thing, but, I mean, maybe that could be a whole conversation in and of itself. Maybe there's a fear of success. Maybe you feel like uh, you don't deserve that money. You deserve that money. You're working hard for that money, okay? Um, if you feel like you don't deserve it, then say, well, I need this money because I'm going to give it away, and those starving children really need this money, so I'm going to try to make as much money as I can for them. I don't know. Just find something that works so you'll stick with the trade. But I don't know if it, is that what you're asking? I thought a stop was your preferred method of ending a trade, so don't all trades end by being stopped out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All trades end by being stopped out. Okay, we're not trying to outsmart the market. We're trend followers. Okay. Keep the questions coming. Uh, good question. Is the 200-day typically stronger support than the 50-day? Hmm. Um, you see, that's going to have to be taken within context, okay? Uh, that CNX we're just talking about, I think it's right at 200-day moving average. I was looking at it right before the show. And the reason I was doing that, and I don't get sidetracked too, too much. Imagine that, me getting sidetracked. If you look at my stop... We're, the stops are trailed like this, kind of stair-step while we're in the swing trade. And then we start letting them gradually open up, okay? So longer term, and I've kind of noodled with this a little bit, but I don't really have a definitive answer. And it's something that you might want to put on your research plate. But longer term, you're going to find that my stops will eventually start looking like a longer term moving average, 
Okay, so I just want to throw that out real quick. That's why I knew that stock was at the 200-day moving average. Now, to answer your question, I think it depends because let's say a stock is in an uptrend. If a stock's in a bona fide uptrend, your 200 is going to be down here and your 50 is going to be up here, okay? So uh, is the 200 more support? I don't know. It depends on, on how it goes there, okay? So maybe you'll get a little support around the 50. I know Phil likes to trade. Phil, you in here? Phil likes to trade off the 50-day moving average. Nothing wrong with that. You do tend to get a little support off that 50. But the 200 might seem like support because if a market corrects all the way down to 200, either it's super duper oversold or a new trend's developing. Well, it's super duper oversold, so it might tend to bounce off of that 200. And then even the 50-day moving average, especially if a market goes a little parabolic, it might be super duper oversold by the time it gets all the way to that 50. So you might just get a bounce over it. So I wouldn't I wouldn't use the moving averages as support that much. I think there's other reasons why they work as support. I don't think they work as support in and of themselves, but I think there's other reasons why they work as support. Now we might just be in, we might be getting caught up in semantics here. Okay, as Phil has observed, you get a little support at 50. Well, the reason you probably get a little support at 50 is because that market has retraced down to the 50 and it's already oversold. So there's other metrics that you can measure that with, but the, the moving averages work fine. That's fine. Okay. So I, I don't really have an answer to your question other than that um, that 200 being farther away m might likely be support simply because the market has gone so far and it's due to bounce back from that level. Okay. Let's see what Phil says. Phil says, Yes, sir. All right. 200 more long-term support, 50 more intermediate support. Uh, as a general statement, you could probably say that. Okay, let's take a look at, like, the S&P 500, and then we'll get to uh, keep the stock picks coming. We'll get to them. So let's just, for S&Gs, take a look at the – I used to have it, but I changed computers. Let's see if we have it here. All right, that's a 200, and then let's say, oh, that's exponential. Uh, and then let's add in the, oh, crap. It's funny, I do this stuff all day long, try to do it live. Uh-uh, ain't gonna work. All right, here we go. Oh, by the way, uh, you see I'm using Telechart here. I, I do use other charting packages, but as far as my uh, stock picking, I almost exclusively use Telechart. And if you go to the Getting Started on my website, uh, use the link there if you want to get started with it. I'm, I'm back in uh, business with these people again. And before I was in business with them, so to speak, I, uh, I recommended them. So it's not like it's just because I am uh, have an agreement with them. So you could see going back in time that the market did find some support at its 200-day moving average. In this case, it broke below it, but it did come back up. Um, I don't know. I wouldn't read too much into it. I mean, it was beautiful right here, right down to the 200. I think it gives you a reference point. I don't plot the 50 and the 200 until and unless the market begins to tank, okay? It's just the way I roll, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll throw bow ties in a chart all the time. I do that quite often. And the bow ties, to those of you who don't know, it's just a 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. I'll put those on in a second just to give me a little reference as to what's going on. Remember, all indicators have lag, especially these longer-term simple moving averages. I wouldn't read too much into them, but, yeah, when the market begins to tank, I think it's important to put the 50 and the 200 on just to give you a reference point. But, again, don't read too much into what's going on there. So the bow ties, it's just a, a 10 simple, a 20 exponential, and a 30 exponential, okay? As a general statement, the order of these will help keep in the right side of the market. Notice that the 10's above the 20, and the 20's above the 30. You had this nice little trend here. Daylight's another concept Step I like with moving averages. Notice that the lows are greater than the moving average, okay? And in downtrends, the highs, you can see the highs here, are less than the moving average, okay? Remember earlier we talked about 2016 where we have really short? 
well, look what happened. The market was going up towards the end of 2015, started rolling over 2016, so we started shorting, okay? That's how we roll. I think we had some shorts back here that were even left over in 2016 because what happened, the market was rolling over. It's like the hokey pokey. That's what it's all about. Trend following. Follow along. Follow being a keyword in that sense. Okay. We have no, we have no, yes, yes. Okay, I think that's back from the sound check. Yeah, okay. So, RG, I'm, RG, I don't have a definitive answer on that. Okay, what I would encourage you to do is uh, do some empirical research. In other words, just look at the charts and see if there's something that makes sense on uh, to you. Okay, speaking of the S&P 500, uh, we've had a pretty good run as of late, today notwithstanding. Um, and as I said earlier, a market will often do the obvious in an unobvious manner. Notice that what did the S&Ps do? Well, they went a little sideways. They began to sell off fairly hard, and that just turned out, so far at least, to be a little shakeout. So it's kind of like, hey, all clear. It's going to go straight back up. Well, today, of course, it sells off fairly hard just to make you feel like it's not that easy, okay? But what you want to do is you want to err on the side of the longer-term trend. Now, if you want to use, let's throw a 200 back in here. If you want to use 200-day moving average as a bit of a proxy for that longer-term trend, then by all means, okay? I mean, I used to do uh, some consulting where I would program trading systems for people, and if it's something that didn't work, they'd, they'd say, throw, throw a 200-day moving average in it and just take longs above and shorts below. Well, the reason that tends to help is a, more, a market's more likely to be in a downtrend if it's below the moving average and be in an uptrend if it's above the moving average, okay? Not that there's anything perfect about that, but it certainly doesn't hurt, okay? So if you're in longer-term trend-following mode, remember this is going to look like my stop, right? Okay, well, 2150. That might be, that would be an area of what? That would be an area where the market comes back to this base. That would be an area where I begin to get concerned. If I were long the overall market, that would be an area where I likely get stopped out and others. And lo and behold, it's the 200-day moving average, okay? I used to uh, be friendly with a trader, and we used to joke. I used to tell the Cajun joke. It's like the thermos, right? The thermos keep the hot things hot and the cold things cold. How, how do we know? You know, it's... So you'll find that with the 200-day moving average and other indicators is that they often converge at the same spot. Now, I don't use a lot of other indicators, so I don't use any other indicators. But with your moving average, you'll find that a moving average also is usually it will converge at a support zone, okay? So a lot of things tend to come together regardless of the technicals that you're using, okay? So, yeah, if you're in longer-term trend-following mode, 200-day moving average, probably not a bad thing to use to help keep you on the right side of the market. I mean, look at this run in 2013, 2014. We never did touch the 200. We had daylight, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average for a long, long time. Okay? So if you're longer-term trend following, he's like, okay, there's going to be some whipsaws along the way from that bouncing Bronco. But for the most part, we're headed higher. I think we'll tough it out. All right, let's take a look at, uh, boy, we're running late today. Chief Orman really wound up. <laughs> all right, S&P 500, so far so good. Uh, we're just off of all-time highs. When the market's in an uptrend like this and close to its all-time highs, you want to err on the side of being long, okay, on, on the buy side. Uh, but do pay attention as trend followers. We don't know yet, but we are going a little sideways in here. So on your stops on existing positions, wait for entries on new positions. And a lot of times, again, not to beat the dead Bronco on that one, uh, that'll keep you out of trouble. NASDAQ, a eh, bit of a bummer with today's action, but eh, they ain't over yet, right? Nice little knockout move, kind of that double top knockout pattern here. Uh, I would have liked to have seen a little bit more, not, not in my portfolio, obviously, but as far as uh, being a market purist, uh, but decent little knockout move. It's big enough to probably scared a few to have scared a few people out. Nervous Nelly sucked in some shorts, and then so far, nice little rally out today, notwithstanding longer term uptrend attack. There's that 200 still on the chart, lurking down here. So positive slope, 
daylight, okay, two good things to look for in a moving average so far. So good. Take a look at the rusty, uh, positive slope in the moving average, daylight, okay. Where would this market be a failure? Oh, if it came back to 120, I'd be pretty concerned, right? Where is that? Well, it's right around this prior consolidation. And it's also right around, uh, lo and behold, the 200-day moving average, okay? So nothing magical about them, but eh, good to uh, occasionally throw on your charts to get a feel for things, especially the shorter-term bow tie moving averages, or especially those. Let's take a look at gold and commodity before I forget. Uh, gold coming off its lows. Uh, somebody emailed me right before the show wanting to know if it's like a micro first thrust. I don't think I would go after gold just yet. I'd prefer if this was like a 10-year low or multi-year lows, but we'll have to see. I don't see any reason to go after any transitional setups, at least in the overall commodity itself, just yet. So I would hold off there uh, and, and see. Okay, It is coming off longer term, relatively low level. So let's just wait and see how that shakes out before getting too excited. Let's take a look at the weekly chart. Yeah, so that would be like 10-year lows, I guess, from perspective. But there's no need to get in just yet and be a hero. Let this thing bottom out. Let it rally up a little bit. Let's see what happens before getting too excited. Let me get that moving average out of the way. But I hear you, okay? It, it is coming off of those lows, but so far I think it's still in a downtrend based on this big blue arrow on the chart, okay? Speaking of gold, let's take a look at metals. And, that was the actual stock. Uh, let's take a look at the golden mining stocks. Golden mining stocks are coming back with a vengeance. A few days ago, I said, hey, guys, be careful with new positions here. You certainly want to wait for entries. And, of course, you want to honor your protective stops just in case. And then so far, they've taken off. What did I say earlier? What do I always say? Markets will often do the obvious in an unobvious manner. They'll often shake you out. And then, of course, go back in the direction of the longer-term trend. Gold and silver here, the stocks at least are lagging. So I wouldn't go after these areas just yet. But if we start to see some uh, setups here, then then we'll have to evaluate them and take them on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, most areas look pretty good. Banks end up, up here at all-time highs. Insurance uh, not too far from all-time highs. Have lost a little steam in here. But for the most part, most of the financials looking okay. Most areas look okay. A couple areas like uh, retail not looking so hot. But overall, most areas, again, looking okay. Semiconductors, not too far from all-time high. So far, so good there. Uh, manufacturing, lost a little steam lately, but now coming back uh, to a lesser extent. Oh, today, notwithstanding, of course. Uh, materials and construction, lost a little steam, but now coming back. These areas, not too far from all-time high. So, when most areas are headed higher, again, you want to err on the side of the trend. Transport's not too far from all-time highs or multi-year highs. Let me double-check that. Yeah, all-time highs in transport. So that's certainly a good thing there. A lot of people like to watch the transports for confirmation. Uh, finally, let's just take a look at bonds. And then uh, I know we're running late, but we'll, uh, I promise I'll get to as many stocks as possible. We'll try to get to all of them. Bonds are looking pretty good as far as bottoming out. I wouldn't rush out and buy the bonds, but I do find them looking kind of interesting. Um, I was in a webinar a few weeks back, and somebody was saying that bonds tend to turn slower than stocks, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, so, but you could see, let's take a little bit of the averages here. Uh, you could see the moving averages begin to turn up. It's risen above the moving averages. So we could have, uh, we could have a bottom in the mist here. Uh, as I've been saying quite a bit, I've been saying for weeks that the descent has slowed. Doesn't mean I don't want to rush out and buy bonds. I still don't want to rush out and buy bonds. But the good news is the descent has slowed, and now they're beginning to roll off of those lows or rally off those lows. So, so far, so good in the bonds, at least as far as a longer-term market is concerned. As you know, bonds down, rates up, rates up, eventually will uh, tap the brakes on stocks. But so far, so good. All right, Jerry wants to know about CETX. All right, let's take a look at that. And, of course, you could ask about any, if you want, if there's any sectors I glossed over, feel free to ask. Yeah, this looks good, Jerry, but what does it need? Uh, or who, said, who asked about this, Jerry or RG? RG? Jer Jerry, uh, it needs a pullback, okay? But that looks good. Put it on your list. Keep it on your watch list, absolutely. What are we looking at longer term here? Yeah, it's a little parabolic, but, uh, you know, Sometimes out of these parabolic patterns, you get a nice little TKO type of move. 
Okay, AM Green on V, actually target RG. Let's take a look at that. I'm not going to like V because it's a big, thick stock. Yeah, you know, this is electrocardiogram type of stock. It's not something that I would be prone to trade. Uh, it's down, it's up, it's up, it's down, it's up, it's down. A bit of a Jackie Basin stock. So I'd leave it alone. I mean, if you're day trading, knock yourself out. But I, it's just not my cup of tea. SND. SND, it's going to be uh, metals. One is called something else. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, Jerry. This looks good. We talked about this one a few weeks ago. It was that buy at B pattern right there around 12. Uh, but now it's a secondary pattern. Wait for a pullback. A little thin, though. Be careful. But as a private trader, sometimes you can do this uh, in those pullbacks. After being stopped out two or three times, find another stop. Well, um, it depends on what you're doing. If you're stopped out daily trading on a stock two or three times, that's likely not going to happen. Uh, but if you're if you're trading some sort of transitional pattern on an hourly basis, like I just said, you might get stopped out a few times in a row before the true transition happens. And that's because, as I often say, uh, what's the saying? The early bird gets the worm, second mouse gets the cheese. And sometimes, sometimes even on a daily chart, this will happen. But it's more likely to happen uh, two or three times in a transitional pattern than uh, something like a in the euro. When the euro top many years ago, it reminds me of that pattern. But Sometimes the market will come up here and it'll make a bow tie down and then it'll sell off a little bit and go up again. And then sometimes this peak might be slightly higher than this one and then it'll make another bow tie down. And that's what I call the second mouse uh, signal. The early bird gets a worm, but the second mouse gets the cheese. So sometimes you'll have a, you'll, sometimes you'll lose on something like this and you have to be willing to go back to the well there. If you're trading a longer term daily chart with pullbacks, I doubt seriously you'll get stopped out three times in a row because that just doesn't look like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the pattern, if you got stopped out, would look like that, okay? And then, I don't know, where you, you'd have to wait for it to set back up again, and then, I don't know, it would look like that again. So I just find that hard to believe, but it's okay to take a couple of trades, and then maybe even in an extreme case, maybe that third peak uh, with the transitional pattern, not so much in a daily, but especially like, if you're trading what I, what I was talking about, an hourly pattern off of a daily chart. But, yeah, it's tough. I mean, psychologically, it's, it sucks sometimes. And then, you know, the hard part is, okay, the, this is the hard part. You know, you, you, you lose, you lose, and you think, well, this thing looks like it's rolling over again, but, you know, I, I'm not going to take this trade. And then what happens? This would have made back all of this, all of this, and then quite a bit. All right, uh, Craig wants to know if CDX is forming a witch hat at the 50-day moving average. Let's take a look at that. CNX. Well, it would be the witch hat. I like. Uh, I like more on the downside. No, no, because a witch hat, a witch hat needs to look like this. Uh, more like like that would be um, a witch's hat. Okay. It kind of it kind of looks like a false uh, head and shoulder top, and maybe that's what it, maybe that's why it works. Uh, I like the witch hat. There's most all the patterns work on the upside to downside, but I like the witch hat better on the downside because I like these sharp retracements back up, and I like to play those on the short side. So the witch hat would be an upside down witch hat. You see the little hat there. So no, this is not because it's not within a solid trend. It would have to be a a, a very solid trend to be a witch hat, okay? This is a sideways trend here. But, Dave, you're a trend follower. Why are you still following it? Well, because I'm not stopped out, and it might be a longer-term trend or a higher time frame, okay? I-C-H-R, arsony unix, uh, arsony. Um, no, not now. Maybe on a pullback. But, yeah, this was another one of those IPO breakout patterns. I was actually looking at this with a uh, – just this morning, um, I was checking that out. Three times a charm or three strikes and you're out. Well, it depends, okay? it's there's, I wish there was a type of little cliche we could say, but there isn't, especially when it comes to markets. Nog. I'm sorry, I'm Arsene, I said you were next. Um, yeah, this looks pretty good. Uh, I like the way it's coming off of these lows. It does have a lot of uh, bad memories. 
I think I'd pass based on bad memories, but I hear you. It's bottoming out. Maybe too many days in the pullback, too. So let's pass on that one. But yeah, you know, let me interview myself. Is it bottoming? Yes. Would I take the trade? No. I think it's better out there. John, that's a setup for today and today's service, so I can't talk about it. But, hey, good eye on that. Good job. Proud of you. you people are uh, paying attention. CTX. Yeah, on a pullback, uh, absolutely, might be worthwhile. That's that's some of my minimalist. That's one I've been watching, absolutely. But wait for the pullback, okay? Phil wants to know about EVBG. That that one looks okay. It's kind of double topish. Let me see if I can find a chart. EVBG. Oops. EVBG. Um, but it's an IPO, so I, I tend to give stocks a little bit of a pass. Uh, that looks okay, Phil. I like it. I think it's on my Landry list today. That's why I knew the stock. So, um, yeah, ask me about the Landry list one separately just so we don't have to talk about them, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Burrell, no, too many days in the pullback on that one, okay? Uh, you want a pullback between 8 and really a maximum of 12. Depends on the trend. Also, notice that it went straight up, and it just barely got past this other high, and then it pulled back to that high. I mean, if you're if you're in this stock longer term, then by all means, right out the longer term trim. But no, not as a new stock. Uh, SD, oop, I can't do that one either, Brett. That's in today's list. Good job, CCJ. CCJ, I might like because the uh, uranium stocks are waking up, and uh, it's it, it's it's nice, okay, and it's it's in an uptrend. But it's getting ready to run into a mountain of overhead supply. So, unfortunately, I'd have to pass on that. Those uranium stocks are crazy. That's the only problem with them. Uh, too many days of the pullback? Question mark. Yeah, too many days of the pullback would be once you have a high in a market, then you start counting days of the pullback, okay? So, um, and... This is all in the stock selection course and maybe even in the intro video. But let's say a market makes a new high. Obviously, it's not pulling back. But once it starts making lower highs, okay, then it's pulling back. And in a pullback, a lot of times, lower highs and lower lows. So this would be day one, day two, day three. So if you're down here in day 12 or 13 or 14 or whatever, then you have to begin to wonder whether or not this prior trend has begun to reverse. Okay, AKS for bars. Oops, discard. AKS is going to be a steel stock. Um, well, put it on your momentum list, but lately it's been sideways. Okay, if you're long, stay long, absolutely. But uh, next breakout, look for a pullback and then go. Phil says, I did not look at the land drills yet today. Great minds think alike, or was I trained to think the same way as you? Oh, I don't know, Phil. Bill and I have a love relationship going on. All right, let's uh, zoom in a little bit. And what time is it over there? It's like uh, 6 at night, isn't it? Uh, I don't know if we got a bad tick here or not. Um, yeah, this one looks pretty good with today's action. Uh, a little bit on the thin side. It is a new stock. Material construction stocks are still in vogue now. Uh, not a huge move higher, but yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm a little bit more lenient with IPOs in this particular case. I think uh, I like it. I, I do like it uh, based on today's action. So yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a high five. Hey, first high five of the day. High five. Aaron wants to know about AMD, Advanced Micro Devices. Um, it's a really big fix stock, but it can trend. Uh, so and it has been trending lately. So, yeah, a little bit more knockout move, though. Maybe down to 10 on an extreme basis, maybe 10 and a half. But wait, for it, wait to see if it knocks out. In the meantime, maybe look for something else. Yum, see long. Why? That's that Chinese stock, right? Chinese yum. That was in the lander list forever. No, I wouldn't be long. Well, it's okay. It, it's This is where it gets a little bit more complex. It's a little bit outside the normal methodology. It's It's a... It's what I would call a deep retracement, a deep IPO retracement, and then some. I noticed it came back through a really low retracement. It's okay, okay? Uh, if I try to start explaining this, it would make no sense to most people here. So I'll give it an okay, but as a general statement, uh, probably not. A VSM? 
just have a stop in it right here, okay, or down here somewhere, just in case. But it, it does fit some aspects of a, of a possible trade. Um, I don't know about these wide range bars in here, uh, a little bit on the thin side, so be super careful with that. I'd have to look at the individual days and figure out. With an IPO, it's tricky because if you look at one day in and of itself, it's going to be really thin. But if you look at the how much trading has happened recently and in, in the in the not so uh, distant past, not so distant past, or around when it came public, you get a better feel for it. Uh, a little bit more, maybe a little bit more pullback. This throws me off here. I don't like these big bars back here. So I would probably pass on that one, but I hear you. Susan wants to know about FRTA. I hope I got the symbol right. Yeah, we just talked about that one. Yeah, high five to use too, Susan. Uh, B-T-O-T-O, -O, back above Ichimo Cloud. Ichikomoko, Ichimoko. Um, I would, I don't know about this cloud stuff. You know, learn, trade by... Trade by, uh, I can't pull that symbol up, but trade, learn how to trade arrows first before you start throwing the clouds in. And then just don't use the clouds once you learn to trade arrows, arrows live, but has some bad memories. Okay. You may have answered your Anichimo. What, how do you, I don't even know how to say Iki, 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 Moko Cloud. Sound like one of those uh, Monty Python characters, you know? Iki, Piki, Piki, Piki. <laughs> uh, yeah, this looks good. Bad memories are a long time away, uh, a way back, I should say. Uh, volatility kind of crazy up here at 90 HV uh, for a very aggressive trader kind of thin I mean I can kind of pick it apart as being dangerous but yeah for a very aggressive trader yeah I mean it looks good okay uh, notice that it accelerated higher and then nice little fairly deep pullback that looks okay that's a good looking stock STLD and AKS so poor people People used to come week after week when the markets were choppy, and I'm like, no, no, no. And they're like, oh, man, he eats everything. He thinks my stock picking sucks, and they left. And then now it's like it seems like nearly every pick I like, you know. <laughs> That's just how it goes. Um, I would wait for new highs in this one just because it went sideways for a while. If you're long, obviously you want to stay long. Ichi michi ikamuku. You know, you can't. You got to be careful not to get sucked into the church of what's happening now. And I don't want to pick on anybody. I mean, I know some people I respect that use the clouds, but just you don't need all that stuff. Um, wait for new highs and then a pullback on that one. It's just, it's just kind of a hover ground. It's old highs. Howard. Uh, T R V. We're going to have to go to lightning round here. L K S D. We've got a few more minutes because we started late. Yeah, this looks pretty good. Um, again, with IPOs, I give them a little bit more of a pass. I don't look for quite the perfection. I don't look for as deep a pullbacks. I'd like to get them, but you don't always get it. You don't always get the perfection. But, yeah, it's kind of cupped handily. Uh, it's kind of hard to say exactly how perfect this is by some sort of metrics. But as far as, like, a, a trader's call, like, if I just saw this pattern, I'd say, yes, it looks good with a few little uh, caveats. But it is an IPO, so let's not get too excited about some of the trading back here. It did clear these prior peaks. So, yeah, I'll give you a high five on that one. I think that's worthy of a trade. Absolutely. TRVG for PG. TRVG. Do we talk about that one? Um, this is a case where uh, I would like to see it uh, make a new closing high, and that could be your possible hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, and close at a new closing high. Okay, that kind of. That's the uh, IPO buy at B type of pattern. Okay. Yeah, it's funny. A couple, um, several people asked about the same exact stock, AKS and STLD, and we, we covered those. Uh, rewind and recording once it's done. Okay, I think my time is up. Uh, geez, I appreciate you guys and girls being here. As you can tell, I love these shows. It's the highlight of my week. So uh, thank you guys for showing up. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. Uh, anything you want to answer question, daviddavelandry.com. Uh, again, I appreciate everyone being here. Check out the uh, stock selection course. No promo code needed. And then, um, you know, shoot me an email and say, hook me up, and I'll give you a few months of the service so you can follow along with the picks. Uh, if we don't talk again between now and the weekend, everybody have a great weekend. And, again, happy New Year. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Leon, Susan, Howard, Michelle, Brett, et cetera. I feel like I'm on uh, a room. <laughs> I see Michelle.